welcome to this new section where we will discuss a lot of things about concurrency. While we talked about threads, we talked about synchronized. And that's the only approach that we discussed until now about concurrency. In this section, we will explore something called locks. We would look at implementations of atomic operations like atomic long, atomic integer and a wide variety of stuff related to that. And also will be introduced to some of the important concurrent collections. We'll talk about concurrent hash map, copy on write array list, copy on write array set and things like that. In this step, let's set the ground up for our particular section. Let's get started with creating a new project. Our project, I would say concurrency. You can go ahead and click finish. Now over here, let's start with creating a very simple example. What we want to do is to create a new class, right? So let's go ahead and start creating a class. Um, the package I would try and use for this is com.in28minutes.concurrency and the name of the class I would give is concurrency runner. Let's have a main method also in here. Good. Right. So we have a concurrency runner class and we have a main method in here. What we want to do is we would want to implement a simple counter. I'll explain you why it's important to understand a counter. We'll talk about something called an atomic operation and the fact that our typical implementation of a counter will not be atomic. That's basically what we would want to discuss in this specific step. Let's create a simple counter class, right? So let's create a new class, control N, class, counter. And in the counter class, let's have a simple int variable as a counter, right? So int i, let's say, is a counter. And I would want to have increment method for i, void increment. Let's make it public. Public void increment. And what does the increment do? Think about it, i++, plus plus, right? So i++, plus plus. let's also initialize the value of i to zero. Let's have a getter as well, generate getters and setters. Um, for i, I only want to have a getter. Cool, this would help us to get the value of i. Using this counter is very simple, right? So all that I need to do is in here, counter, counter is equal to new counter. And I can say counter dot increment and I can say sys out counter dot get i. This might not be a perfect implementation of the counter, but it's good enough, right? If I increment it thrice, it would increment it three times. So that's pretty cool. That's kind of standard thing. Now, one of the things that you would need to realize is I++ plus plus looks like a very, very simple operation, right? But actually, when we look at it in depth, it's involving three operations. What are those three operations? The first thing is to get the value of I, increment, and the third one is to set the value of I. Now, let's say this counter is shared between five threads. What would happen if, let's say, Two of them are trying to do the increment method and the first one has done the get i and the second one also also has get i so let's say the current value of i is 15 right so the current value of i was 15 the first thread did a get i so it gets what does the value thread one gets it gets 15 the second thread also at the same point did a get i so what does it get 15 the first thread increments it so what does the value become 16 and it sets it to i so the value of i at this point would be 16. Now the other thread now has the value of i as 15 so it would increment it as 16 and it would set the value of i as 16. So even though two threads have done the increment from 15 the value should go to 17 but what would be the value in i it would be 16. So the thing is I++ plus plus is not really a thread safe operation in the sense that if I'm executing the same method at multiple threads, there is a chance that some of the updates might be missed. This is called not thread safe. Thread safety is when 
a method can be safely run by multiple threads at the same time. However, this method is not thread safe because there is a chance that an update to i might be lost. And that's where we talked about synchronized. So if you put a keyword called synchronized, then only one thread at a point in time would be running this specific method. So if there are two threads trying to run this method, the first one is starting to get, execute this, and then the second one has to wait for this specific thing. In this specific video, we introduced you to the concepts of thread safety. We understood that even a simple operation like I++ is not thread safe. We saw that I++ is actually a set of multiple operations. It's not really atomic. So multiple threads might be executing multiple sets of operations. And therefore, we said we have to use the synchronized keyword to make sure that only one thread is executing this method at a specific point in time. That's cool. Now, this is thread safe. However, there are a few problems with this kind of an approach. In the next step, we would discuss about these problems and look at furthermore solutions for this problem. The idea behind this section is to kind of give it like a journey, right? You set the context, you try something, you try some other thing, and then at the end, you end up with a solution. So it's kind of a journey from the basics to kind of the advanced stuff related to concurrency. We'll look at other approaches in the next steps. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this step, let's look at some of the problems which we might face with a synchronized approach. Right. So this counter has just one variable that is being incremented. Right. So let's say I have a new class. I'm copy pasting it. Counter. So I'm calling this by counter. So by counter, and I would want to say by counter. And over here, we would want to have two variables, int i is equal to 0, int j is equal to 0. Oops, I forgot to have a private on the i. That's not cool. So private, let's add private on the counter as well. I don't want i to be accessed from outside. Right. Let's encapsulate it better. Now, because this is a by counter, I cannot just call this increment. It should be increment i, and this should be get i. That's cool. So increment i and i plus plus. Now what I'll do is I'll copy these methods, synchronize public void increment j, and I would also say get j, and this would be returning j back, and this is doing j plus plus. So this would even involve get j, set j. Only one thread would be able to execute j plus plus at a specific point in time. This is a by counter, right? So we took the similar logic from the counter. So we just took the approach of the counter and created a by counter. And this is a very, very, very simple example, right? If you look at real world applications, it would be much, much more complex than this. Now, think about it. What is the problem with this approach? I have two methods which are synchronized. Increment i, increment j, both these methods are synchronized. What is the problem with synchronizing both of them? Only one thread can be executing any of the synchronized methods. So there might be one thread waiting for increment i, the other thread waiting for increment j, even though these two operations are completely different. So i++ will not affect j++ at all. Only one thread would be allowed to execute either of these methods. This is the case when there are two methods. Imagine if there are 10, 15 synchronized methods which are present in there. And there are a lot of threads waiting to be executing those methods. This would have a significant performance impact. Basically, the problem with synchronization using synchronized is the fact that only one thread can be executing all the synchronized code on an instance. So if there is a lot of synchronized code on a specific instance, it would have significant performance impact. In the next step, let's discuss a solution for this. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In the previous step, we understood the problem with using synchronized. In this step, let's look at a solution for it. 
we would talk about locks and how they help you to prevent the problem that happens with the synchronized keyword. Let's copy this code by counter, control C, control V, and I'll say by counter with lock and say OK. As we discussed with synchronized keyword, everything is synchronized in the sense that all the code is synchronized and that means only one thread is allowed to execute any of the synchronized methods. Locks help you to break the synchronized code into multiple sets of code. With locks you can say I would want to get the lock and at the end you can say I would want to release the lock. So you can say at this point say get lock for this particular thing and you can say release lock at the end of it. Same thing, let's remove this. We know that I++ is a complex operation. It's not as simple as it looks. Let's remove this as well. So get lock and I can say release lock. So locks allow you to say, okay, I would want to get the lock for this specific thing. And with locks, the thing is you can get the lock instances. So you can have a separate lock for this method and you can have a separate lock for J method. So you can get lock for I. You can say release lock for I. Get lock for J and you can say release lock for J. That means that if two threads are trying to execute increment I and increment J, they'll be allowed to execute them. However, if two threads are waiting for increment I, they can only execute it one after the other. That's basically what locks allow. So let's now implement a lock. Lock, lock for i. So I'm saying a lock for i is equal to new reentrant lock. So reentrant lock is one of the implementations of lock. And let's import lock as well. Control one, command one. And I'll copy this and have lock for j as well. Now, I would want to get the lock for i. How do I get the lock for i? So lock for i says lock for i dot lock. And over here I can say lock for i dot unlock. And the same in the synchronized methods as well, right? So here I would be using a different lock. And lock for j dot unlock. That's it. Doesn't this code look cool? I would need to also remove the synchronized because synchronized is no longer needed. What we are using is locks. So what would happen here is when I say lock for i dot lock, what would happen is this call would check if there is any other thread having a lock i. If no other thread is having a lock for i, then it would get the lock. It would acquire the lock, go ahead and do the i++, and then it would release the lock. When I'm executing lock for i dot lock, there is another thread holding a lock, then we would wait for it to release. So basically, we are actually having locks for different parts of code. The thing with locks is instead of having one big synchronized chunk of code, we are breaking it up into multiple small chunks of synchronized code. So a thread can be executing this and in parallel another thread might be executing this as well. That is the flexibility that locks provide. There are other methods which are present in locks as well. So you can kind of look at a few other methods which are present. Lock for i dot this try lock. Try lock tries to get the lock then and there. So if it does not get the lock, it would return a false back. So you can react to that. The other one is you can also say try lock with time and a time unit. Basically, you can say I would want to wait for the lock for 10 seconds and no more than that. So possibilities like that exist with lock, but at the simplest level, this is the code that we would typically write. Lock for i dot lock, lock for i dot unlock. And that would al allow us to make this code synchronized or make this code thread safe without going in for synchronized. In the next step, we would look at how we can improve this further using atomic classes. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. 
One of the important reasons why we had to have the locks is because this is not an atomic operation. This involves three steps and that's the reason why we cannot do I++ and depend on it being thread safe. Right? What if there are more thread safe operations? What if there are classes that are providing those thread safe operations? That's where the idea for atomic classes comes into picture. Let's look at a few of the atomic classes in this specific video. Let's go to the by counter with lock, control C, control V, and I'll say by counter with atomic integer. Thing is, over here we are declaring it as an int. Instead of int, if we use atomic integer, so atomic integer is one of the concurrent classes. So you can see Java util concurrent import it in so you can see java util concurrent atomic atomic integer that's where it is and now it cannot be zero i will say new atomic integer now why should we use atomic integer good question let's look at it so i'll create j also using atomic integer and now i can remove the locks why because atomic integer provides basic atomic operations. So if your methods are just doing basic atomic operations, then you can remove the locks. What I can do here is i dot increment and get. What atomic integer does is it provides increment as an atomic operator. It makes sure that this piece of code is automatically thread safe. So once I call i dot increment and get, I can rely on atomic integer making sure that it is thread safe and the same thing now over here it should be get i should be i dot get and instead of j plus plus increment and get and instead of get j j dot get now the responsibility we are taking away from our locks and giving it to the class called atomic integer however you need to understand that this approach will not work for everything the fact is we are doing a simple increment and that's why atomic integer is good. But there might be multiple steps in your operation which might need thread safety and in those kind of situations you have to go with a lock. But in this situation because it was a simple operation we go with an atomic integer. If you look at the atomic integer class you can see that it says an atomic integer is used in applications such as atomically incremented counters. This is the one which we used. It says atomically increments the current value. As you can see, there are a number of get and set methods. There are also methods like get and increment, get and decrement as well. So decrease a value. And also you can do get and add as well. So there are a wide variety of atomic operations that atomic integer offers. And other than atomic integer, there are other classes as well. So if I double click it in here and to this. So you can see that there is atomic boolean, atomic integer array, long, long array. And also there are classes called long adder and long accumulator. We'll look at long adder a little later in this specific section, which would help us to do things like addition and subtraction also in an atomic way. The idea behind this step was to introduce you to the concept of atomic classes. We looked at atomic integer, an example with it. We looked at a few methods with it and also we looked at other atomic classes which are present in the Java util concurrent.atomic package. Until the next step, bye bye. Welcome back. In the previous steps, we looked at synchronized keyword, we looked at using locks and also we looked at atomic integer and a few other atomic classes. In this step, Let's discuss about something called concurrent hash map. We'll look at an interface called concurrent map and we'll implement a simple example using concurrent hash map. Concurrent hash map is part of something called concurrent collections. Thing is, with the emergence of logs as an option to synchronize different methods based on different logs, there are new kinds of algorithms that are emerging to enable thread safety. And all these concurrent collections use different kinds of algorithms to provide 
thread safe code which can be used in different kinds of scenarios. One of them is something called the concurrent hash map. Now, what is the problem with a hash map or a hash table? Hash table is thread safe, right? So what is the problem with it? Let's look at it in this specific video. Consider this code we wrote while we were doing collections, right? We used a hash map and what we did in here is we were trying to find out how many times a specific character occurred in a string. And to find that, what we did is we tried to get the character from the hash map and if it's null, then we put a value of one. Otherwise, we put a value, we incremented the number of occurrences. That's the logic which we are implementing in here. We know that hash map is not thread safe, right? So this one is not thread safe in any way. But imagine we are using hash table. So instead of hash map, if we were using hash table, even then this code would not be thread safe. What we are doing in here, there's a chance that one thread reads the thing and before that thread processes it, another thread also might try to read the character and thereby an update might be lost. The important thing is this whole thing is a complex logic and there might be a chance that different threads are executing different parts of it. What concurrent hash map provides is a combination of atomic operations like this. What we are doing in here is if it is not present, we are initializing it and setting a value of 1. If it is present, then we are incrementing it. So for operations like this, concurrent collections provide basic atomic operations. Let's look at that when we talk about concurrent maps. Let's open up the concurrent map interface, concurrent, so control shift T, concurrent map. If you look at the concurrent map interface, there is one method which is present in here, compute if absent. What the compute if absent method does is if the key is not present, if the key is not present in the map, it would default the value to whatever value is returned by this mapping function. When we talked about lambda expressions, we looked at functions. So if we create a function and put a reference to it in here, whatever value is returned in here would be made as the default value if the key does not exist. And after that, you can perform whatever operation that you would want to perform. So the entire operation that we are seeing in here is offered by a simple atomic method in the concurrent map. There are a lot of other operations like this which are present, compute is present and a lot of other things. The thing is, these operations are all atomic in the sense that once you call it, you can depend on it being thread safe. It's not like this code in here, which is definitely not thread safe and the responsibility of making sure that it is thread safe falls on you. In this step, we looked at the fact that this kind of code might not be thread safe. And we also talked about a few operations which are present in the concurrent hash map, which might help us to make this code thread safe. In the next step, let's try and implement that. Until the next step, bye-bye. Welcome back. In the previous step, we discussed the fact that code like this might not really be thread safe. And we said we would be using concurrent map to make this code even more thread safe. In this step, let's look at how to implement it. We would start off with implementing the example with a hash table, and then we would switch that example to use a concurrent hash map. Let's create a new class. I'll call this concurrent map runner with a main method and click finish. And let's create a string. So string str is equal to, let's just have ABCD, ABCD, ABCD. And we would want to find out how many characters are there in, I mean, how many times a character repeats, right? Typically, when we solve problem like this, what we would do is we would say map of character, because you would want to find out how many times a specific character is stored, and we would say long or integer, right? So what I'll do now is not use long. Typically, we can also use atomic integer or atomic long, because it would ensure that the increment operation is atomic. With long, the increment operation is not atomic because it involves multiple operations. So to introduce 
a new class to you, I would use something called long adder. And over here, what I'll do is say occurrences is equal to new. If you want it to be thread safe, you can say hash table, right? Let's import hash table. Actually, hash table has a T small. And let's import map. And let's import long adder as well. So the typical way we would be implementing this operation is by saying for char character in str.2 char array for each character we need to check if this character is in occurrences occurrences dot get for character so I'm saying long adder is equal to that if long adder is equal to null what we want to do we wouldn't want to say long adder is equal to new long adder we can say long adder dot increment and after that we can say map occurrences dot put it's it's typical code right there is nothing uh, very difficult about this character comma long adder the reason why we use long adder is because it provides an atomic increment operation if we were using integer we had to do i plus plus that would mean that it's not an atomic operation All right so now you can see that this is typically how we can do that and now i can say sys out occurrences and now i can say run you can see that space is pre present twice a is present three times all the others are present three times right so that's cool i mean that is how we would typically do it but when we look at these three lines of code these are not really thread safe because we are getting this so let's say two threads execute this code at the same time what would happen and let's say the character is present five times before that so the thread one would increment it to six however the thread two also had the value of five so it will also increment it to six so an update is lost to prevent that from happening we have the concurrent hash maps when we want to use a concurrent map we can do this so concurrent map is equal to concurrent hash map and import it in so now we are using a concurrent map you can see that concurrent map offers all the operations that a typical map offers in addition to that concurrent map also offers other methods so i can say occurrences dot compute if absent so if the specific key which is the character is absent what i can do is i can create a mapping function when we learned about lambda expressions we learned how to create a function right he, here you can see that it's a function the input is a character and the output is a long adder so what i can do is i can take a character ch and the output i can return is a new long adder So what does this do if it's absent it would set the value to long adder and now i can do a increment so all this code will not be needed anymore so it does the increment and also the put now let's see what would happen if i run this code no change in output so all the code that was present earlier is now replaced by an atomic operation and that's the beauty of going for a concurrent collection. Concurrent collections make a lot of operations which involve multiple steps into atomic operations. I would recommend you to spend some time looking at the other methods which are present in the concurrent map as well. I'll see you in the next video. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In the previous step, we saw that concurrent hash map 
provides certain atomic operations which are not really present in a hash table or a hash map. The thing is that is not the only advantage of a concurrent hash map. In this step, let's look at another important advantage that a concurrent hash map provides. The thread safe alternative for concurrent hash map in earlier versions of Java is hash table. And we know that in hash table, what is used to synchronize? All the methods are synchronized. That means if I'm inserting in any of these buckets, let's say I'm inserting in bucket six, a value. And at that point, the entire hash table is logged. The entire hash map is logged. You cannot do anything with it. The other thread has to just wait. Concurrent hash map takes an intelligent approach towards this problem. It says, let's divide the hash map into multiple regions and let's create locks around them. What I'm saying is just a simplistic way of looking at it to make it easy to understand. However, the regions might not be according to the buckets or things like that. With that disclaimer aside, let's say this entire hash map is divided into three regions, right? So I would say the region up to four is considered to be one, nine is considered to be one, and the remaining is considered to be one more. With a concurrent hash map, if you are inserting in one region, you can do updates and retrieval from the other region because concurrent hash map uses different logs for each of these regions. So this region one uses a different log compared to region two compared to region three. Different logs are used for each of these regions. Thereby, you get not only the advantage of atomic operations, but also you get better performance. So if a thread is doing operation on region one, another thread does not need to wait if it has to do operations on any of the other regions, region 2, region 3, or region 4. That's the advantage that concurrent hash map provides. In this step, we looked at another advantage of a concurrent hash map. In addition to the atomic operations, it also divides the hash map into multiple regions, and each region have a separate log, thereby increasing the amount of concurrency that is possible. I'll see you in the next video. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In the previous step, we looked at concurrent hash map. In this step, let's look at a few other concurrent collections, which are based on an algorithm called copy on write. If you do a control shift T and search for copy on write, you would see copy on write array list, copy on write array set. What is the copy on write thing? And what are the operations that you can do on copy on write array list and copy on write array set? As far as the operations are concerned, it's no different. The copy on write array list also implements the list interface. So it does not provide you any new operations. Whatever you can do on an array list or a linked list, the same operations you can do on copy on write array list. But there is a small difference in terms of how it's implemented. As you can see in here, the copy on write array list says a thread safe variant of array list. It's a thread safe, so it's thread safe, in which all mutative operations, so add, set, whatever operations which make changes are implemented by making a fresh copy of the underlying array. So that's the name, right? It's copy on write. Copy on write, what it does is whenever you make a change, it copies the entire array. So underneath the array list is an array that we know, right? So what happens is whenever I modify anything in a simple array, it would make a fresh copy of the entire array and copy the elements into it. As it says in here, it is very costly typically, right? Copying the entire array is not going to be a very efficient thing. But the thing is, this kind of an array list is very efficient when you're going to read a number of times. So you are going to do a number of reads and very less changes in your array list. So if you have situations where I'm doing 10,000 reads from an array list or 20,000 traversals in an array list, but only 15 insertions or 20 updates. In these kind of situations, the number of updates are very, very less. And the number of traversals, the number of reads are very, very high. 
In those kind of situations, this might be a useful alternative because when you use this kind of an approach, you don't need to synchronize the read operations. You don't need to use locks and on the read operations. All that you need to do is make sure that your write operations are synchronized and thereby you get a huge performance boost. Let's create a simple example. This is no different from an array list actually. So let's create a new class. I'll call this copy on write array list runner and have a main method and over here list list is equal to new copy on write array list oops let's just say string and over here I will say list of string you don't need string in here right okay copy and write array list import import list control one that's cool so enough I can say if let's say we are just adding a few strings right so we are doing and bat so this is no different from a typical array list. I'm repeating this multiple times, right? Let's say there are multiple threads which are inserting values. And let's say the number of threads which are inserting the values are very less. Let's say three threads. And there are 10,000 threads which are looping around this and doing a list dot get operations. So let's say there are 10,000 threads which are actually at a point in time they're looping around the thing or let's keep it simple let's use a for string if i run this it's no different from typical right and bad cat that's it but let's say this is in a separate method and this is in a separate method and there are three threads which are inserting values very rarely, probably it's they are inserting 15 to 20 values in total, but there are 10,000 threads which are consuming the list values and printing them. In these kind of situations, if I synchronize everything, so if I'm synchronizing all the methods at the same time, so let's say I'm synchronizing the add method and I'm synchronizing the get method as well. What would happen? At any point in time, only one of these 10,003 threads would be able to execute the add or the get. And that would impose a severe performance penalty. What copy on write array list does is it only synchronizes the add operations. It does not need to synchronize the get operations because it implements add operations by copying the entire array. So while it's copying the array, the other threads can continue reading the old array. That's not a problem. Once it copies it, then it switches the old array with the new one which is created. Copy and ar write array list does a little bit more work, not little bit, a lot more work when there is a change that is done in the array list. But the advantage is in that you'd get more concurrency. One of the other things that you'd need to understand is the fact that based on your usage scenario, you can come up with new algorithms to make sure that you get the right performance to ensure that you have the right amount of concurrency. So based on the kind of operations that are present, if there are more reads and very less writes, or if there are a lot of writes and very less reads, you can create locks or you can synchronize different parts of the code differently using locks and things like that. And thereby you'd be able to get better concurrency. Copy on write array list is one of the such implementations. Copy on write array set. This is the one I was talking about. So copy on write array set and copy on write array list are an implementation of this copy on write approach. Until the next step, bye bye. Welcome back. In this section on concurrency, we took a big journey starting with using synchronized to synchronize the counter and we discussed the advantages and disadvantages of using synchronized and then we looked at by counter we said by counter has problems 
because of the synchronized keyword and we said let's implement it with a lock. We implemented by counter with a lock and then we moved into atomic integers. We said this kind of implementations using a lock for the basic atomic operations are provided by things like atomic classes. One of the atomic classes is atomic integer. We also talked about atomic log and wide variety of other stuff. After that, we switched into the concurrent collections. We talked about concurrency map or actually the concurrent map and we looked at an example of concurrent hash map where it divides the entire hash map into multiple regions and it ensures that different logs are used for different regions thereby promoting more concurrency so you get more performance. The other thing we looked at is the atomic operations that it provides as well things like compute if absent. Atomic operations like this would ensure that writing thread safe code is much more easier. After that we looked at copy on write array list. We discussed the fact that copy on write array list is perfect for scenarios where there are very few writes but a lot of reads. Copy on write only synchronizes the write operations because it creates a copy of the whole thing on modifications. It creates a new array whenever something is modified. Thereby, the need to synchronize the get methods, the read methods is removed. The idea behind this section was to give you a big picture of everything which is involved. So that in your mind, you have a high level picture of what's going on. The details with things like this are not really important. It's very important to have a big picture in your mind very, very clearly. And that's what this section aims to provide. I hope we were successful in that endeavor. I hope you had a lot of fun doing this section and I'll see you in the next section. Until then, bye-bye. This video is part of a Java course with more than 250 steps helping you become an expert on Java. You can find the complete course details in the description of the video. Along with it, you can also find the details of a free PDF with 200 pages of awesome code examples in 28 minutes, creating great programmers.